My faith is in God alone, beyond a reasonable doubt. This brainstorm yeah. pouring rain on your season of drought. Yeah. Just trying to lay a couple seeds in the mouth. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Yeah. You ever get the feeling? What up, y'all? It's your hometown hero, Scott Land, the Black Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. The Real Adam Coleman. So, you rocking with True ID? Uh, there's been a lot of talk about identity. Who am I? You know, who who are, you know, as people of African descent, you know, here in the Western world, you know, you know where do we come from? You know, what, what are our roots, so to speak? Well, I guess it depends on who you ask, right? I mean, if you're floating through the social media world, you come across some Hebrew Israelites, they're going to tell you that you're an Israelite. You know, you're part of the, the lost tribes and that, the, you know, the real Jews were black. And then, you know, you're them. Right. Uh, of course, you talk, maybe go to a different thread, a different, you know, website or whatever. Talk to some more scientists. They're going to tell you that you're a more and that you uh, should be practicing some type of Islamism. You know, you know, the whole noble Drew Ali type stuff, you know, but you're a more according to them. Then, of course, you have the Egypt camp. You have the guys who will say that it all flows from Kemet. And that everything goes back to that, you know, that you, you know, we're part of this line of, you know, pharaohs and queens and whatnot, you know, from Kemet. Uh, but who's right? You know, um, are any of them right? Um, well, I'm sure that's about as continues to rage on, you know, amongst uh, amongst those different camps. But, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to identity, you know, um, which is the main premise of the show. I mean, you know, true ID. Right. Uh, go figure. So um, I've got an identity theory. Um, it's kind of in development. You know, I'm in the process of writing a book. I think I mentioned that last episode. Uh, you know, I'm still gathering sources, still studying up on it. But this whole thing with identity, I think, is at the core of a lot of the stuff that we're seeing. You know, I think it's at the core. Uh, so you know, let me give you an example. So let's say you know, if you go to the doctor, right, and uh, you got a, you got something that ails you, you know, um, in order for the doctor to give you the right treatment or the right medication. Uh, he's first got to give you the right di- diagnosis, right diagnosis. If he doesn't give you the right diagnosis, then he's far less likely to give you the right treatment. Right. So uh, you know, I think it's kind of the same way um, when we're dealing with, you know, the stuff that's going on in the um, African American community, you know, and then, you know, African diaspora abroad, but you know, definitely the African American community and, and really, you know, society at large, you know? So, um, how you diagnose an issue is going to affect how you uh, pursue resolving that issue. Right. Uh, so, so let me give you an example. So let's say that, uh, you know, let's talk about, you know, these cop shootings, right? So if your diagnosis, you know, for the cop shootings is this is white supremacy, right. Or just, just uh, outworkings of white supremacy. Then you're going to approach these uh, shootings a certain way. Right. You know, you know, when somebody, uh, when a black person gets shot by a white cop, you're going to approach it a certain way. You're going to make certain assumptions. You're going to protest along certain lines. You're going to be, you know, you're going to approach it a certain way. Now, on the other hand, you have a group of people who would see the same incident, you know, a black person getting shot by a white cop. They're going to give it a different diagnosis. They're going to say, you know, well, there's more criminality in the black community. Now, if you give, um, if that's your diagnosis, then you're going to, probably not be so interested in the protest. You're probably going to focus more so on maybe personal responsibility within the African-American community. You know, you're going to maybe focus on uh, the criminality of, you know, maybe stepping up, uh, you know, prisons and, you know, what, I don't know, whatever else it may be, you know, just kind of taking the more legal route to suppress uh, criminality. So, you know, depending on how you view, uh, well, depending on how you diagnose what's going on in these instances, uh, you're going to approach them a different way and, and come to different uh, ideas on what's going to resolve the problem because you're going to have different perspectives on the problem, right? So again, you know, I think it's the same way, you know, with um, at least at least from my perspective, you know, I think there's a problem going on within the African community. Uh, well, several of them actually, you know, so I'm just going to try to deal with a with a piece. I'm going to break off a piece of it, um, and I think we have to diagnose it. 
you know, properly in order to, you know, really deal with it in order to really come to, um, some solutions. Right. So that's why you know, I call it the identity diagnosis. Now, what, what do I mean by that? Um, among African, uh, you know, people of African descent, you know, there seems to be an identity crisis, uh, which to a degree, I think is kind of reflected in how we refer to ourselves you know, as black, right? I mean, after all, black is a color, you know, it's not a nationality. It's not a ethnicity, you know, it, it's a color, <laughs> you know? Uh, so the very term black is kind of like a, a makeshift uh, cultural identifier. I mean, when you think about it, you know, from the time that we've, you know, come to this country, you know, we've been black, you know, we've been called colored, uh, Negro, African-American. Uh, you know, some folks drop the African and just say they're American. Some folks drop the American and just say they're African. You know, I mean, there's been all sorts of, of different um, just kind of nomenclature type of uh, struggles there. You know, how do we name ourselves? And I think that that's kind of indicative of that identity piece. Right. Um, I think that you have among some groups in this country, they can, they can reach back to from whence they came, you know, and, and really claim it. You know, if you're an Irishman, maybe you can claim Ireland or, you know, I don't know where, where are you from? You know, um, there are other groups of people in this country who can have, who may have an easier time. I don't even think it's a may. I think they do have an easier time reaching back, you know, to their uh, heritage and roots than people who are of African descent, obviously because the way we came here. <laughs> obviously, um, you know, it's, it's funny, man. I mean, this, this whole terminology thing, man, it, it's just, I think it's so uh, telling in terms of the struggle of African identity in this country over a period of time. You know, I was just, you know, dialoguing with somebody the other day on, on Facebook and they referred to um, African-Americans as, as colored people. I'm like, dog, that's like, I mean, really colored? Like we, like that word is so, <laughs> I mean, it's like, what, 1960s, 50s, whatever? I mean, who, who says that now? You know, and it didn't appear that this person was all that old, you know, so, so I wouldn't think it would be part of their vernacular, you know. Um, but anyway, it just kind of just goes to show. I mean, it's just so how many different names. And, you know, um, at one point, the term color was perfectly fine. You know, it was it was considered to be appropriate. Now, it's obviously not considered to be appropriate. You know, I, I think in some ways, you know, not, I don't want to get off on too too much of a tangent, but I think, you know, the confusion about how we are to refer to ourselves, how uh, black people are to uh, be referred to, I think almost opens the door for the use of the N-word amongst black people. You know, I mean, if you don't have a firm, fixed, acceptable way to refer to yourself in a, in a dignified manner, then it kind of just opens the door for just about, you know, whatever, you know, it kind of makes it you know, a little easier to just kind of usurp other terms, whether they be good or bad. Um, you know, but anyway, maybe that's a conversation for another day, you know? So again, you know, just, just this idea of blackness, this idea of just being black, you know, like, where, you know, where does that come from? You know, how do we get to the place where that is such a central identifier of people here in the Western world, you know, who have African descent. Well, I mean, obviously it doesn't come from Africa. I can tell you that, you know, I mean, we think about it, you know, prior to the transatlantic slave trade, you know, color just wasn't as central of an identifier, you know, um, we, I mean, just thinking about it, you know I mean? It's, if you grow up in an area where everybody is, you know, just about the same shade, you know, relatively, you know, somewhere, I mean, being black becomes a less important identifier because everybody black. Right. I mean, if everybody's black, then, you know, it just doesn't really to, to call somebody black. Just it just doesn't mean as much. Right. It's not as meaningful as in terms of being able to dis distinguish this person from that person. Unless you're coming across somebody who's just, you know, way more you know blacker than you or whatever. I mean, like every every hood, you know, you have uh, a kid, you know, they call black so and so, you know, the kid might just be real dark skinned. So maybe there's a, a, a black, you know, Scott. You know, and then kind of like a light skinned Scott. And they'd be like, you know, yo, I was talking to Scott the other day. Oh, which Scott? Yo, yo, black Scott. You know, I mean, stuff like that. I mean, somebody's just, you know, way blacker or something, <laughs> way, I say blacker, way darker, you know, then maybe, you know, that becomes a good identifier. But, you know, by and large, I mean, when you're dealing with people who are called, who are pretty much all in your same range of hue, you know, of color, then the term black 
you know, just becomes uh, less important or uh, less effective, you know, less useful, I should say, in terms of distinction, distinguishing between uh, people groups. So, you know, before the transatlantic slave trade, I mean, it was more so about there were there are several other factors uh, that people use to identify themselves and distinguish themselves from other other people groups. You know, so, for example, I was talking with a friend of mine the other day. Um, he's from Ghana and he was kind of breaking down to me, you know, the um, different different groupings, I guess you can say, over there in Africa. And he was just kind of breaking down how you kind of have families and then you have uh, a group of families can, you know, will make a clan and then you have several clans constitute a tribe. And then, you know, from there you might have a nation or, you know, what have you, you know, but you have those different uh, breakdowns, you know. Um, so, you know, but, you know, before slavery, I mean, you know, your family, your clan, you know, that was an identifier, you know, what clan you come from, what tribe you come from, you know, um, we'll, we'll certainly get into uh, the slave trade later on, but uh, even within some tribes, you know, the clans within certain tribes sometimes would be at odds with each other and sell one another into slavery, you know, to the Europeans. Yeah, hmm, yeah we'll definitely come back to that. Um, but, you know, what tribe you come from? That's a, that's a distinguisher and identifier, right? Um, also another identifier might be what religion you practice, you know, um, you know, what form of spiritual spirituality you practice. I mean, of course you have, um, you know, a lot of animism and natural religions over there in Africa prior to the slave trade. And, uh, some of those would be based around a certain locality, you know, geographical location. So, if a certain group worshiped at a particular stream or a river or whatever, or maybe at a particular mountain, you know, people who practice that certain religion or that certain form of spirituality, you know, um, they would have that in common. And so they could kind of identify with one another and, and kind of form this collective identity based around, you know, how they worship. Uh, of course, language, you know, what language you spoke, you know, obviously that's going to be an identifier, you know, uh, that distinguishes uh, between uh, between folks. Um, another thing that might uh, be an identifier uh, that's non-color related is, uh, of course, your attire, you know, how you dress. Um, then you also have markings on the skin. You know, I think it's the uh, Yoruba tribe. Uh, I think they do with like the three marks on the cheek or something like that. Or, you know, I mean, just different markings on the skin. Or maybe if you're looking at a uh, National Geographic or whatever, I mean, you see people with certain types of piercings, you know, that might be indicative of... Um, you know, uh, what tribe they belong to. Actually, a funny story. Back in like 2000 and, um, 2004, I was on a missions trip uh, in Kenya, right? And so I'm at this store, you know, just buying some trinkets or whatever. It's kind of some memorabilia type of a thing. And um, I'm standing there, you know, just waiting, waiting in line or whatever. And this guy just starts, you know, talking to me, you know, in uh, whatever, you know, uh, indigenous language he was speaking in. And I didn't know what he was talking about, you know. So he was just kind of going for maybe, you know, a minute or so. And um, he, I guess, based on my facial expression, he realized I had no clue what he was saying. So he, so interestingly enough, I said something, I guess to tell him that I didn't know what he was talking about. And uh, he said, oh, you know, my bad. You know, I thought you was uh, part of my tribe, you know, based on my height and uh, my build at the time. I was probably about 120 pounds <laughs> lighter than I am now. So I was kind of tall and slim. I think, I think he was part of the Maasai tribe. And so he thought that I was part of the Maasai based on my stature and based on my build. Um, but I guess whatever group he was with, um, their tradition is that they knock out their two front teeth, I guess like a rites of passage or something like that. And so anyway, when he saw that I had my two front teeth, he recognized, he recognized that I was not part of that group, you know? And so this is kind of, it's very interesting. So but anyway, my point is that, you know, the physical demarcations, you know, was another way by which people would identify themselves. You know, they obviously had nothing to do with color. They were distinguished based on those type of um, you know, demarcations, uh, of course, foods, you know, that's another thing about, you know, that another identifier, you know, depending on what region you live in, and you're probably going to prepare different types of food. So that becomes a part of your identity. Um, so anyway, it's just very interesting. I mean, there's just so many other ways that, um, people would used to identify themselves before slavery. They had nothing to do, you know, with color. So, you know, obviously you have this network of factors, you know, that served to make up, you know, one's identity. And, you know, clearly it was, it was certainly disrupted, <laughs> you know, violently. So 
by the transatlantic slave trade. You know, you think about uh, tribes and villages and so forth, you know, these communities, you know, uh, from which people can really derive their sense of self being just totally um, just, you know, ripped apart, ripped to shreds, you know. Um, so you, you go from being part of a community to being reduced to just a commodity, right? You go from being a person to cattle, right? People became cattle uh, during this transatlantic slave trade. Um, you know, basically just biological farm machinery. Now, when you think about it, cattle don't need religion, right? I mean, you know, nobody or many, I guess, you know, I would say at least many slave masters who, who did view other slaves as being nothing much more than cattle. I mean, they weren't all that concerned <laughs> or religious preferences of their slaves, you know? Um, so for some, you know, many were just ambivalent uh, to uh, what was going on, you know, with their slaves uh, in regards to religion, as long as it wasn't causing any uprisings, you know? Now I know that uh, the common perception is that, uh, you know, there was like this fluid, you know, relationship, you know, between Christianity and the slave trade, uh, you know, where it's just pretty much just, you know, you got the kind of Kunta Kinte scenario where the slave master is beating the Bible into him. Well, um, not from what I'm studying. You know, I, I don't think that uh, the evidence, the, the historical evidence that we have available, available uh, bears that out uh, across the board anyway. Um, now, were there some instances in which, you know, obviously Christianity was used inappropriately? Of course it was, obviously. Um, but that's not the end of the story. Yeah, we'll save that for another day. Anyway, um, but yeah, so, you know, cattle, uh, cattle don't need family, Right. Um, it's easy to uh, break up families when you don't see them as families. You know, if you think you just got a, a male buck and a, a female, whatever word they would use, I mean, of course you can just kind of breed them and then, you know, sell the offspring down the river because they're just cattle, right? You know, uh, nobody worries about preserving the personhood <laughs> or identity, personal identity of a mule or a piece of farming equipment. You see, so you have this context that, you know, slaves found themselves in where personhood didn't matter. Their identity just didn't matter. It just wasn't an issue. What mattered was how much were they worth? How much did they produce? You know, from an economic standpoint, that's what they were sold into, you know? So you have our ancestors being taken from their land. Their family connections are severed, their cultural ties broken, religious practices that they were accustomed to and, uh, the geographical areas that they, that they were in, the villages, you know, just all now an ocean away, you know, separate from all those um, natural means by which normal people uh, derive their identity, right? Taken out of their context um, and just brought over to this, you know, Western world where the identity doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what tribe you're part of. Matter of fact, I mean, the slave masters, I mean, or traders rather, would try to split up folks from different tribes so they wouldn't collude together and, you know, try to overthrow this ship or escape or what have you. You know, you want to break people up. You don't want too much unity and uh, uh, commonness among these uh, these commodities that you've that you've picked up. Right. Uh, that's just I'm saying just from their perspective. So I, th I think even before kind of maybe going back a bit, I mean, when you think about it. Um, even before leaving the continent of Africa, I think this identity um, decline or uh, this loss of identity began, you know, before even getting onto the slave ship. I mean, when you think about it, um, the reality is, I mean, people don't like to talk about it, but, uh, you know, selling slaves was a was big business among African nations. Um, I mean, I grew up, quite frankly, I just took it as a given, you know, that the slave trade consisted of a bunch of, you know, uh, big, bad, you know, white people going over to the continent of Africa, yoking a bunch of people up, stealing them and then selling them, you know, you know, over here in the States or whatever. You know, I kind of just I just assumed that, that was the case. Well, once again, I mean, the evidence is uh, hmm, paints an interesting picture there, doesn't it? If you've studied it, then you know what I'm talking about. I mean, uh, tribes, you know, uh, selling people from other tribes or selling people from even within their own tribe. You know, I mean, it was it was big business. You know, big business. I was listening to Henry Louis Gates uh, the other day, and uh, you know, he, he said playing out that I mean, if it wasn't for the participation of the African nations in the transatlantic slave trade, uh, it never would have went down. 
Couldn't have gone down, you know. Um, the reality is, um, if you were sold into slavery to the Europeans, you probably come from a tribe that lost a war, you know, and as a result, you know, your your ancestor was probably, uh, you know, captured and sold to Europeans or or maybe your ancestor was, uh, you, they might have been kidnapped by a fellow African, and that's even interesting there, and uh, again, sold to the Europeans, or maybe, you know, they were a criminal, you know, or some undesirable of some sort, sold to the Europeans for that reason. There's all sorts of number of reasons. But the bottom line is, you know, I think even before, I mean, imagine just, imagine you're you're part of this tribe, and you're you're proud of your tribe, you're proud of your people, and boom, y'all lose this war, and now you're being shipped off uh, by people who look like you. But, you know, um, imagine how difficult that would be. I mean, already your identity, your self-esteem is being crushed. Everything that you've known and taken pride in is gone. Before you even leave the continent. And then you get, again, like I said, you sold into this context where your identity doesn't matter anyway. As long as you can pick cotton or whatever your task would be. So, you know, it's through this process, I think, that the whole concept of, of quote unquote, being black became a primary identifier. um, As opposed to the variety of other ways that Africans had identified themselves prior to the slave trade. I mean, when you think about it, if you put on a ship and then, you know, kind of moved around here and there, you end up on a plantation where nobody speaks the language, you know, where you come from, possibly. Um, you don't have a lot in common. You don't know where you are and who these other black people are. I mean, you know, it becomes real easy to identify, hey, the guys with the whips in their hands are this color <laughs> and the guys doing all the work are that color, like me. So it becomes kind of easy to say, OK, well, we know that based on this color thing, there's a differentiation here. It becomes easy. You know, that blackness becomes easy to identify who's with you and who's not with you, right? Um, now, f- for the Europeans, I mean, you know, during your 1600s, 1700s, I mean, you have, you know, different theories about the African going around, right? African peoples going around. Um, ultimately, uh, one that was prominent was that based on the your color, you know, um, the darkness of your skin, well, I guess basically the darker you were, the, I guess, less evolved you, you I guess maybe that'd be the right way to say it, or, you know, uh, kind of lower down on the totem pole as far as humans go. Um, the lighter you were, the higher you were uh, on that totem pole. So obviously Europeans would put themselves at the at the top of that, you know, and I guess maybe some of the, you know, Arabs would be somewhere in the middle and then black folks, we were just on out. You know, if it was real dark, then you were considered to be lower on the human scale, you know, so to speak. You know, so that kind of emerges, you know, and um, being black uh, becomes a way by which uh, Europeans then can justify enslaving people, you know, because if you're lower on the totem pole and maybe just barely not an ape, (laughs) you know, then, you know, they feel justified and say, okay, well, we can we can subjugate you then. Right. Right. So, you know, that was one of the the main um, theories going around at the time, you know, which obviously (laughs) African people came up on the short end of the stick on that one. Um, but you know, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent. I mean, I guess, you know, but I think that's part of my problem, you know, with, um, some of these super pro black folks, you know, uh, where everything is just about, you know, being black. I mean, because, you know, not, not only, you know, as I spoke about already, not only is quote unquote being black, uh, inadequate, you know, I think as a, a central identifier for people, um, but on top of that, I mean, you know, the the racial concept, you know, of blackness, you know, and what that means and grouping people according to color, you know, centrally, you know, according to color, that whole racial concept was a product of the very oppressive system that these folks want to oppose. So it's really, in a way, it's kind of self-defeating. It's like, you know, being black, that concept was given to you by the slave masters that you're so upset about the same slave masters you're upset about in regard to Christianity also imposed upon you, um, this blackness thing. Right. So people want to put up memes and all this kind of stuff. Like I said, I'm, yeah, I ain't going to stay on this all day, but look, man, people want to put up memes after meme after meme about the slave master beating Christianity and the black folks. Well, I mean, I mean, just really think about it. just, just kind of think with me, just, you know, you may not agree with everything I say. That's fine. Just, just, just think logically. Tell me if I'm being logical or not. You know, send me some hate mail or something, whatever. If I say I'm a Christian, 
right? Which I am. All of a sudden, you know, some people are uncomfortable with that. They feel like, oh, you know, you're like a, a sellout, you know, or you know, the slave master would, you know, beat that into your ancestors. Like, you know, would you be a Christian if your slave master, you know, wasn't a Christian? I mean, all that kind of, you know, stupid genetic fallacy stuff. So anyway, you know, but if you say that you're black, then I could also say, well, the slave master beat that into you. If you if you consider yourself, if your starting point for how you identify yourself and whom you identify with is the color of your skin, the slave master gave you that. Right. So how are you going to come to me, <laughs> you know, for quote unquote practicing the slave master's religion? When you base your identity off the slave master's race concept. See how silly it gets? I mean, it, it just, it's, it's just silly to me. So, you know, I mean, or even if, we, if you want to get tricky, if you, you want to say, okay, well, I'm African. Well, guess what? The, the word Africa, that term was, isn't indigenous to the continent. That was imposed upon Africans by the Romans during their time of conquest. So if you want to say, well, I'm just going to be African. Well, okay, fine. I, personally, I don't have a problem with the term Africa. But don't get mad at the Christian for, quote unquote, practicing the slave master's religion when either your concept of self also derives from the same Europeans that you're upset about. For white folk, right? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's just a kind of hypocrisy there with that. I ain't going to stay on that all day, man. But it's just, that's just one of my pet peeves. The concept of blackness as being a central identifier in terms of race came from the slave trade. I'm not saying that nobody before that time had ever factored that in your color in to how people group themselves. I'm not saying that, but in terms of being a central identifier and you know, that, con- that conception of race came through the slave trade. Right. So, you know, you gotta be careful what you say. Sometimes me and, you know, biting yourself in the butt, I think, you know, when you want to throw that at Christians, but then at the same time, you also <laughs> hold to a perspective that clearly uh, undeniably came through the slave trade. I just keep on moving. But anyway, so, you know, like I said earlier, man, you know, I think there, there are a number of things that demonstrate the um, struggle, you know, among African peoples. You know, I, I'm, I'm speaking from an American context. You know, um, I'd be interested to hear from, uh, you know, maybe people from, I don't know, the Caribbean or, you know, uh, Europe or what have you, maybe some folks over in you know, England or whatnot. It'd be interesting to hear from them, you know, see if they have a different angle. I'm, I'm speaking from an American context. Uh, but um, you, you see that struggle, I think, in, in various different ways. And, um, you know, like we already talked about, you know, the terminology, you know, people using different terms, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, black or colored or, you know, uh, African-American, Negro, you know, whatever. You know, those that struggle to find the right term as to how people of African descent in this country should be referred to. I think is uh, indicative of, of that identity struggle or trying to reclaim that sense of identity. Right. Um, but then, you know, other things like, you know, just simple stuff like, you know, uh, the black is beautiful movement. Right. Um, you know, people wearing afros and, you know, got the afro pics and, you know, uh, just loving their hair, the nappy hair and all that kind of stuff. African apparel, you know, you see it in the sixties and seventies. Uh, when I was a kid, you know, my dad took me to see, um, uh, the Malcolm X movie, you know, uh, but played by Denzel Washington. And um, I'll never forget that scene, you know, where they're, they're doing the, um, the he's, he's getting his hair. I think it was, it was uh, Lias Soap. They were putting their hair and straightening their hair out, you know, and that was kind of earlier on before he was, uh, you know, before he was Malcolm X, you know, he was kind of, but I guess they were just kind of illustrating, you know, um, that taking on of uh, quote unquote, you know, white culture or white identity, you know, and they were kind of just using the, um, how people used to process their hair is kind of an example of that, you know, but, you know, people getting away from that, getting away from, you know, slicking the hair and all that kind of stuff and embracing the, the Afros and the nappiness, I think is, you know, um, uh, you know, was an attempt to, you know, regain, you know, some of that Africanness, right. Uh, or maybe even the black exploitation movies, you know, of your what late sixties and mid seventies, uh, you know, shaft and all that, you know, I mean, I wasn't around during that time, but, you know, just talking to my aunts and uncles and uh, my parents that, you know, for them, it was just such a, a big deal, you know, to see uh, black folks, you know, on the big screen, you know, and, and playing roles, uh, well, leading roles and uh, in some cases, her, uh, heroic roles, you know, as opposed to just being like a, uh, you know, a bellhop or something like that, you know, a side 
character in a movie, you know, so that being a big deal, you know, people taking pride in that, uh, just really embracing that, you know, blackness, you know, um, you know, what else? Uh, well, names, <laughs> uh, you know, when you, when you look in the hood and, you know, I guess not just in the hood, but, you know, you have all these Isha's and Quans, you know, and Trayvon's and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, those sounds and, and kind of what people were doing with the names and, and you know, have been doing with the names, I think is, is a way of, of trying to, uh, reclaim or maybe create, uh, that, uh, kind of an African esque, you know, distinction, you know, among us, uh, people trying to, you know, reclaim that, you know, uh, I guess maybe Isha to some people sounds African, I, I don't know, whatever, but yeah, you know, I think that's kind of where that comes from, you know? Uh, so stuff like that, or, or even religious ideology, which we'll definitely, um, get into that quite a bit. Um, but you know, back in the day, you know, I'm thinking back during the civil rights time and whatnot. I mean, um, you did have this element where people would say, well, you know, Christianity is the white man's religion. So therefore, you know, uh, you need to be in the nation of Islam. You know, that was kind of like the thing. Um, so it was, it was considered to be more black to be a Muslim, you know, than to be a Christian. So I think you had a lot of folks, you know, you know, leaving the church and going over the nation of Islam on that basis. Well, nowadays, you know, fast forward some, you know, 30, 40 years or whatever. I mean, it's kind of more nuanced. Now it's, you know, Christianity is the white man religion, so you need to be a uh, black Hebrew, Israelite. I think they prefer the term Hebrew Israelite. Or you need to be uh, a Moor. You know, you need to practice more science. science. Um, you need to embrace the whole Egypt thing. You know what I'm saying? You need to get into this comedic stuff. You know, so stuff like that. So, you know, it's kind of gotten more nuanced, I think, um, from then till now. Um, interestingly enough, I think, and I, I really... It'd be interesting if um, somebody's done a study on this, but it seems to me that kind of under the, along with the civil rights movement and the, um, the cultural, I guess, reclaiming of African heritage, you know, amongst some subgroups, you know, in the African American community, you have who I call like the the teachers, right? Um, And what I mean by that is you have these guys who may not have been as well known, as, you know, certainly like a, a Martin Luther King or a Malcolm X or something like that. But nevertheless, you know, you do have this this subgroup or, um, well, I'll just say this lesser known group of uh, people who were, I guess, kind of, you know, giving their own two cents and chiming in and being influential in regard to this reclaiming of Africanness. So so there would be people like, uh, you know, Dr. Ben Yohakanen, uh, you know, Dr. Henry Clark, uh, Dr. Ante Jop. Uh, you know, some of these guys, you know, you, you kind of see them now, they pop up on the internet and, you know, they have these YouTube videos and, you know, from like the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, these guys, um, I think you, these guys were kind of like an undercurrent, you know, where maybe they weren't as notable, um, as some, um, prominent figures, you know, in those civil rights movements and whatnot, but they did have some influence, you know, and I think they're starting to, I think the, there's been a resurgence actually of their influence, you know, like I said, due to the internet. Um, but then you have even, uh, you know, guys who came along after that, say in your in your 80s and, and 90s, you have guys like uh, some super underground cats like, you know, Bobby Hemet, um, you know, Phil Valentine, uh, Booker T. Coleman, um, you know, um, a lot of the guys that you might see on, say, like a Hidden Colors videos. You know, you, you, you can find some stuff from them, you know, going back into, you know, the 80s. So so you have this, you know, group of, of teachers that fuel, you know, some of the... Um, like, like I'm talking about, you know, the, the reclaiming of this Africanness. You know, they kind of added their two cents in. I think it'd be interesting for somebody to um, kind of do a study on that, you know, um, in terms of, you know, that growth. Because I think this, from out of that, you see um, this progression into our modern day uh, consciousness community, you know, where now you have guys like, you know, Brother Polite or, of course, uh, you know, Dr. Umar Johnson. Umar Johnson, I think he goes by something else now, but it's, it's Umar something. Um, you know, guys like that. I mean, you have the, these more modern guys who have kind of taken up the mantle, uh, so to speak, of these old teachers. So uh, hopefully, you know, one of these days I'll be able to kind of go back and, and uh, explore that a little bit further. But anyway, my point with that is you have this group of people who are, you know, putting out information um, along the lines of, you know, reclaiming that I, that lost identity. Now, what's interesting about that. Is that um, from what I can gather, you know, from listening to a lot of these guys and, you know, reading some of their materials is uh, pretty much across the board, you know, in reclaiming 
uh, Christian identity, I mean, excuse me, and claiming uh, African identity, uh, Christianity is pretty much on the outs. I mean, you know, that's like one of the <laughs> prerequisites maybe to, um, you know, getting back to your African side is, you know, you got to let that white man religion go, you know? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. And then we'll get back to that, but I, it, it seems like they really, I mean, I guess you hear, you know, Farrakhan doing the same thing. You know I mean? He, he's a little more slick with it now. He doesn't really, um, you know, depending on who he's talking to, he may not be as, as overt about it, but you know, it's still that kind of anti Christianity sentiment, you know, and I think it is, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say it's gone hand in hand with the cultural expression. Um, this anti-Christian cinema has gone hand in hand with this uh, kind of pro-African cultural expression that we've seen kind of grow over time. Like I said, we'll get back to that. Actually, what I would like to do, maybe um, if I can get enough information together, is to try to uh, just paint a picture of, you know, this modern, what they call the consciousness community, um, and just kind of paint a picture of kind of how it came about and all that kind of thing. I don't, I don't you know, be interested if somebody has some information on that, but I'd like to cover it at some point. Um you know, aside from just religious, I mean, I think, you know, even political uh, movements have been kind of born out of that uh, struggle, you know, for um, African identity. I mean, of course, Pan-Africanism, you know, that's kind of where you get that, right? You know, actually, I have a whole, I'm planning a whole show to talk about Pan-Africanism as it relates to Christianity. Um, hopefully, some of the things I cover might surprise you, actually. Uh, but, you know, or theology. I mean, of course, you know, black liberation theology, you know, kind of. It sounds black, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, black liberation theology, you know, but I think that's kind of uh, also, you know, um, intertwined with, you know, the, that uh, yearning to reach for one's, you know, blackness or Africanness or, you know, however you want to say that. Um, so anyway, I think, you know, in various ways, you have trends of black people um, looking to retrieve, you know, the Africanness and, and as they do so, you know, uh, and I'm thinking more so these, you um, kind of undercurrents of cultural expression, you know, these different formations of the so-called consciousness movement. I think, you know, people tend to, you know, latch on to everything that they perceive to be African and at the same time shun everything that they associate with Europeans. And then of course, you know, since Christianity is um, associated with Europeans, then Christianity kind of gets thrown out, you know, as well, you know, um, interestingly enough, I think that's you know partly because people have just you know literally no <laughs> uh, understanding of uh, church history, or you know if they did that they, they would at least you know think twice. But anyway, um, I think that that has something to do with it. You know, um, it's on that basis that you have I think a lot of folks you know pushing away from Christianity, you know, because there's this perception of it being the uh, so-called white man's religion. Um, it's, it's like there's this, you know, and I'm, you know, kind of rehashing different ways. I'm trying to figure out how to, you know, express it. But basically, there's this notion that based on the fact that white professing Christians were the same folks that enslaved our ancestors, and through that process, a good number of African slaves, you know, came to adopt Christianity, that somehow there's this incompatibility between being black and being Christian. You know, I mean, that's really what what it comes down to. I think among the consciousness community. That's why Christianity is on the outs, you know, um, and, and I think that it's unfortunate. You know, it's like you kind of like I said, you know, there's like the Uncle Tomness to, you know, being black and being Christian, you know, which I think is fallacious. And we'll be talking to that, talking about that as well. Um, I think for people who are non-Christian, um, it's that type of thinking, you know, um, associating, you know, slavery, and Christianity and so forth. I think it's that sort of thing that, you know, obviously is a barrier, clearly, you know, to people who are of African descent, you know, becoming Christian, you know. Um, I think it's somewhat different when it comes to people who are already Christians and then maybe you're facing, you know, this issue of is my faith at odds with my African heritage? I think it's kind of like um, I would use the analogy of uh, if I having a rock in your shoe, you know, uh, if you have like that little pebble in your shoe you're trying to walk somewhere and it's getting on your nerves. It's kind of like nags at you. You know what I'm saying? I think that there are people out there uh, of African descent who are, um, who love the Lord, you know, uh, would identify themselves as being Christians and, you know, sitting up in church and everything, trying to live it as best they can. But it's like these sorts of questions, you know, um, you know, would I be a Christian if, if the slave masters weren't Christian? You know, those types of questions, I think are kind of like a, st- a, a rock in somebody's shoe. You know, they're trying to walk with the Lord, but they've got these things kind of nagging them. You know, and so what I hope to do is, is remove that rock. You know, I want to remove that little 
pebble. And I think that we can do that um, just by simply uh, surveying history and uh, some philosophy. We'll get into that too, but uh, just some basic historical stuff for the most part, I think we'll address that. And so, you know, we got that upcoming in a couple of uh, shows, uh, certainly with some of the guests that we're going to be bringing on. Um, you know, some people, you know, press on in spite of this uh, rock in their shoe, you know, some people do. And, uh, you know, and that's fine. And then some people, uh, it hits them in a different way. You know, some turn away from Christianity toward atheism or the belief systems that they believe to be more in line with African heritage. You know, uh, I've named a couple of them, you know, like the Hebrew Israelites, the comedic types, uh, or even voodoo, you know, or some various forms of African, you know, spirituality, quote unquote, um, intervention from ancestors. You know, people get into all different types of stuff, you know, I think. And I think, you know, it's, it's just very interesting, you know, so... As, as I'm kind of, you know, just floating through the social media world, you know, just checking out different videos, to, you know, just dialoguing with different folks, you know, really trying to get a better understanding of this uh, consciousness community. I mean, actually, there's a lot of things about it that I like. Uh, but one thing I think is interesting is that, again, this identity issue is just so inescapable for folks, I think. Um, and it, it's just, it is really, it is the it is the basis, I think, of the whole consciousness community. I mean, when you think about it, most people, when they use that term of, you know, becoming conscious or a conscious community, they're referring to awakening, you know, to um, one's Africanness or something about, you know, like knowledge of self or something like that. They'll put it different ways, but just kind of awakening to oneself and by self meaning, you know, one's African self, you know, so, you know, stay woke, right? I mean, that's that whole hashtag, stay woke. That's, that's what that's about, you know? Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's the whole consciousness theme, you know, awakening to oneself. It's, it's so intertwined um, and just enmeshed with this this identity issue, you know, it's this idea that you are currently asleep to your true identity and you need to awake to it. Right. Um, so, you know, if you, if you look at it, um, if you look at the community, you find certain belief systems and ideologies that are uh, prominent. You know, um, I guess to use an analogy, uh, anybody that knows me knows I, I like, you know, mixed martial arts. You know, it's, it's my thing. Uh, no, not for everybody, but I like it. So anyway, um, this you know analogy may not work for everybody. But I'm gonna give it a shot. Um, in the mixed martial arts world, um, you have you know four basic fighting styles that are probably the most prominent. You know that would be boxing, wrestling, uh, some form of jujitsu, and then uh, some form of of kickboxing. You know those are like kind of the four pillar uh, fighting styles. You know. Um, and I kind of use that as an analogy because in the uh, consciousness community, you have um, four um, main ide- ideology systems, you know, that are pretty much accepted, you know, or, or prominent, I should say, in those circles. And they would be the Hebrew Israelites, the Moorish scientists, the Egypt guys, kind of, you know, Imhotep, Imhotep Kemetic spiritualists. Um, and then, of course, you have your um, your atheists, you know. So you got those kind of four strands that you kind of run, you know, uh, run together. And so as long as you you fall in one of those camps, um, you know, of course, there's a lot of debating and stuff that goes on amongst them. But, you know, you're pretty much OK. You know, it's like debating amongst brothers. As long as you're in one of those camps. All right. You know, we're going to disagree on some stuff, but, you, you know, you're all right. You know, but as a Christian, you know, Christianity is just just out. <laughs> you, you know, it's, it's Christianity and the consciousness community just doesn't mix. You know, that's just not um, how they get down. So anyway, with these different um, ideologies that I think are most prominent in the consciousness community, what I find about it is it's not just belief systems, but they're all in different ways, statements of identity. Okay, so let me show you what I mean. So with the Hebrew Israelites, right, they're not saying just that you ought to worship Yahweh. Their central claim is that you are an Israelite. That is your identity. You are an Israelite. And based on who you are as an Israelite, a Hebrew, the real Hebrews, you ought to worship Yahweh, keep his laws and so forth. You see what I'm saying? So it's not just an ideology. It's a statement of identity. And then followed with it, coupled with it is the ideology, you know. So the the ideology flows from this statement of identity. Okay, so likewise with the Moorish scientists, you know, it's not that they're not just saying that you ought to practice uh, their form of Islam. You know, I think they use the term Islamism rather than just uh, strict Islam. Um, they're, they're not saying you ought to just practice Islamism. They're saying that you are a Moor. Somebody from, I think that the right term is Mauritania, ancient Mauritania. But anyway, 
But they're, they're saying you are a more. And based on the fact that you are a more, what you need to do is you need to go get your um, your citizenship changed uh, so you can declare your sovereign citizenship or something, however they term it as being a more. And then, you know, following that, you know, goes the belief system along with it. So it's not just a belief system. It's an identity system, you know, for each of those two examples, the Hebrew Israelites and, and the more scientists. Likewise, with the, with the folks from Kemet, even though I think it's a little more subtle and even not just Kemet, but. Uh, some of the African spirituality folks, it's it's this idea that your ancestors believed and did such and such. So you should believe and do such and such, you know, uh, your what you should believe and what you should be doing today follows from your ancestors. And because your ancestors were this type of African or that type of African, that's where you need to go ahead and, and reach back and conform to that. But see, again, it's the, the ideology and the beliefs follow the identity uh, issue the, or identity statement there. So it's, so it's not just a belief system. It's an identity system that is coupled with a belief system. You know, now, interestingly enough, even with the atheists, I think among the, um, among the consciousness community crowd, even the atheists, I think it's about identity. And the reason why I say that is we, I noticed that when they come in contact with Christians and the debating and so forth, um, you know, one of the main arguments is, well, you're black, so you shouldn't rock with Christianity. I'm black, and I don't rock with Christianity because Christianity is, is, is at odds with being black. So at the end of the day, it's still identity. Because of who I am, I'm not going to participate with such and such belief. You know what I'm saying? So their, to some degree, you know, their uh, beliefs or lack thereof flows from um, who they perceive themselves to be. I'm black, so I'm not going to be a Christian. You know what I mean? That, that sort of a thing. So, you know, with each of these um, prominent belief systems that uh, really circulates in the, in the, um, the consciousness community, they're not just belief systems. They're identity systems. And the identity is kind of, you know, primary. It's, okay, now that you found your identity, here's the belief system that goes along with this identity that you had previously lost. That's kind of the gist um, behind all, you know, the, these groups you know, that, I, that I've seen. Um, it'd be interesting if, you know, if someone, if somebody wants to correct me on that, you know, kind of, you know, they can hit me up an email, but, but I think it's just kind of an interesting observation. It's, it's not just belief systems alone. When you're dealing with these different ideologies in the, um, in the conscious community, it's an identity statement here. So, um, and again, I think that goes back to the whole, that, cause again, it's all about awakening to one's true identity. And so it's all about, you know, reaching back and trying to find that source of identity and allowing that identity to transform you in the present by your awakening to it. You know, it's all about reaching back, but I think they don't reach back far enough. You know, you know, you know, let me just go ahead and put, you know, put all my cards on the table, you know, and, and just tell y'all what this is really about. And a perfect example. I, so I was dealing with a guy on Facebook the other day, right. And he said something that I get all the time. And just various different ways uh, from different folks that I deal with who I guess would be kind of considered in that, that consciousness com community um, and some of these other belief systems that I've been talking about. Um, he said, I used to be a Christian, but I found out who I really was. I'm a Hebrew Israelite, so now I'm no longer a Christian. Now, that is interesting. And I, I keep hearing that in so many different ways. I found out who I really was. Dot, dot, dot. So now I'm not a Christian. Now, what's interesting about that is it wasn't as if he said, you know, I came across some some scriptural evidence, you know, that say Trinitarian teaching was wrong. And so that's why I'm not a Christian. Or um, I was doing some research in history. And I think that the uh, evidence uh, concerning the resurrection is resurrection is suspect or something like that. It wasn't anything like that. It wasn't challenging Christianity on historical or doctrinal grounds or anything like that. His central. um the statement there is, I found out who I really was. That was the driving point to him leaving Christianity. It's that identity piece. It's that identity, right? I think African Americans, and I keep saying African Americans, but you know, I really mean people of the African diaspora, you know, um, from slavery onward. Um, I think people, you know, of African descent have been so starved for identity for quite some time now. That 
you know, it's, it's just like with a person who's starving, you know, for food. I mean, if you're starving for food, I mean, you'll eat anything. I don't care. You know, if somebody's starving, they'll eat, you know, ramen noodles, uh, you know, McDonald's, uh, lobster, steak, or, you know, a fish sandwich. It doesn't really matter. You know, now chitlins, I don't know about all that. That might be a bit of a stretch. Even if I was starving, I don't know if I'd rock with the chitlins. But, um, but anyway, <laughs> you know, people who are starving, they're going to eat. They're going to eat. doesn't matter what you put in front of them. And I honestly think that in the same way, uh, with people of the African diaspora, they're starved for identity. And so anything, you know, they, they'll just latch on to anything. As long as it sounds African, as long as it, you know, um, seems to reconnect them with their, the, the roots that, they, that they've lost, they'll just jump on it. They'll jump on it. And it's a shame because, you know, it's like as black folk, you know, we want to fill that gaping hole in our soul. Um, Related to identity so bad. We want to fill that whole up that identity hole so bad. You know, and if something gives us that little self esteem or some sort of, you know, um, you know, I don't know, just that whatever. It just we're we're all on we're all on it. We're all on it. And it's really sad because, you know, now you've got folks, you know, making leaders and teachers out of themselves. Uh, taking advantage of these identity related insecurities that we find within the black community and trying to build movements off of it. And I think that's shameful. I think that's shameful. But again, you know, we're just so hungry. We'll just take anything. So it doesn't even matter if, if, you know, X, Y, Z information is true, if it's backed by good evidence or, or not, you know, if it satisfies that itch for that identity itch, we're all about it. We're all about it. When I say we, I mean, obviously it's not everybody, but I think that there is a, um, a significant number of people to whom that shoe would fit. And I hope that they're listening. I hope they are. You know, I mean, you don't need to be a Hebrew, a Moor or a Pharaoh to have you know, a meaningful identity. <laughs> you know, you don't. You don't. Go, go back to, you know, Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 26 said that God created man in his image and in his likeness. God created man in his image and in his likeness. Genesis 1.26. Um, now, I know I, I, I'm preaching to y'all. I know. I'm, o- I'm only two episodes in and I'm already preaching. I can't help it. My mom's a preacher. My dad's a preacher. You know, it is what it is. Uh, so it, it's just in my blood. But, you know, um, yeah, Genesis 1.26 says God made man in his image and in his likeness. You know, um, our first identity, our first identity was God given. It was, you know, right when God breathed life into man, you know, he made us in the image of God. That's our first identity. You know, uh, yeah, I respect, you know, I really do. I respect people's desire to, you know, reach back, you know, it, to find, you know, their heritage. And, you know, I'm, I'm a history guy, too. I love history, you know, and, and um, I appreciate my heritage, you know, as much as I've learned of it. And um, so I understand that. I understand that. But before there was a, a, a black, a white, Hebrew, uh, Egypt or America, there was man made in God's image. God's image. Um, I don't need to rely on, you know, lineages or, you know, what nation I belong to or, you know, um, citizenship or anything like that to to be my source of self-esteem when it comes to identity, because I get my identity straight from God. From Yahweh, my first ancestor. I'm reconciled to the giver of identity by the blood of Jesus Christ. It says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18, that we've been reconciled back to God. You know? Um, yeah, so, you know, let me go ahead and share this one last scripture with y'all, and then I'm going to close. <laughs> I always wanted to say that. Um, grew up in the Baptist church. So, anyway. Um, so, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, says, Wherefore, seeing we are surrounded 
by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. You know, basically so easily takes hold of it. So it says, lay aside the weight and the sin. Treating it as, you know, it's speaking that weight and sins are two different things right there. Okay. Um, you know, so let me give you this example. So, you know, Bo Jackson, right? Um, I was watching a documentary on him the other day, and I forgot how ridiculous of an athlete this dude was, man. It's just just crazy. Um, I mean, the stuff that he was doing as an athlete, it's just just pure genetics. You know I'm saying it was just just he was just born with it. Um, so anyway, uh he was known Bo, Bo Jackson was known for his speed and power. You know, on the football field, once he got the ball, once he got going, man, it, it wasn't but two things that was gonna happen. Either he was gonna uh run by you or he was gonna run over you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he was either gonna outrun you or he was gonna run over you. It just it is what it is. It was what it was. Um, he was known for his strength. You know what I'm saying? That's what he was known for. I mean, you, know, you can go back and look on YouTube. I mean, he's breaking bats over his knee, breaking bats over his head. I mean, he was just a strong dude. Pound for pound, he was just a strong dude. He was known for his strength. Now, what's interesting is his career was cut short by injury. And the you know basically the way it went down, long story short, um, he was running. And somebody got a hold of his leg and he tried to, you know, continue to run. He basically tried to pull out of the guy's grasp. And he basically pulled his own hip out of his socket. He was just so strong and he was so used to breaking tackles that he pulled his hip out of his socket, basically. You know, because he had this two, 300-pound dude laying, you know, or got a hold of his leg. He tried to pull it out. It didn't work out so well. Um, But I just think that's fascinating is that, you know, the thing that he was most known for, is what ended up costing him his career, his strength. They did an interview with a doctor and said that, you know, for, for the average athlete, uh, the way that Bo Jackson got tackled on that play, it would not have resulted in a career-ending injury. But because he was so strong and pulling away from this guy, it was actually his own strength that ended up killing his career with that tackle, trying to drag a weight, that other player, drag a weight, that he was not intended to carry. A man is not intended to carry that kind of weight in that kind of a way. So likewise, there are weights, I think, in our lives that may not necessarily be sins, but it may be a weight that we're carrying that we're not meant to carry. Right? I believe identity is that kind of a weight in the black community. I believe that, I believe that the identity issue that uh, that loss of identity, that seeking for identity, that thirst and hunger for identity that has been uh, unfulfilled in so many different ways. Um, and just, you know, with with uh, black folks in this society being kind of at the bottom of the totem pole in terms of being esteemed, that identity piece is a weight amongst people of the African diaspora, you know. Um, and the thing of it is, I think one thing I've noticed about the, the consciousness, consciousness community that I think is a strength is just this thirst for knowledge. I mean, like I'll go online sometimes and look at, you know, just different YouTube videos. Sometimes you see a video might be like three and a half hours long and have like 70,000 views, you know, which is crazy. You know, I mean, people will sit down and listen to somebody talk, you know, for three hours and some change, you know, because it, it's, you know, in a sense, ministering to, or I don't even want to use the word ministering, but it's addressing that need, that weight in regard to identity. You know, um, when I looked this passage up, the Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse one, I looked up that word weight. Uh, the earliest manuscripts that we have of Hebrews is written in uh, in Greek. And the Greek word is on, onkos. Uh, and it basically means a burden and, and encumbrance. You know, I believe this identity issue is an encumbrance and a burden among so many folks in the African American community. And what I'm saying here is let's lay that aside. I'm not asking you to lay aside your identity. I'm asking you to lay aside the, the burdensome um, unquenched thirst for identity that has been satisfied with false uh, identities, you know, um, I believe obviously in the uh, consciousness community. Let's solve the identity issue 
by going back to the beginning, our first God-given identity, the image of God. That's what true ID is all about. That's what it's all about. True ID stands for the real you, Imago Dei. Uh, Imago Dei being the Latin words for image of God. The real you, Imago Dei. That's what this is all about. So let's take that journey together. With that said, um, episode two is in the books. Appreciate y'all riding with me. Uh, Scott Lane, the Black Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. The Real Adam Coleman, signing out. See y'all next time. Peace.